For the past eight weeks, I've been mastering day in, day out on the best pair of studio monitors I've ever used. A three-way design that is so good, they've even given our beloved ATCs a run for their money. And they've now been demoted to James's video editing suite, soffit mounted with twin 15-inch ATC subs to boot, so he's a very happy bunny. But he's nowhere near as happy as I am. I've been working faster, leaner, cleaner, revisions have been, well, there haven't been any, and translation to other systems has been the best I've ever achieved. And feedback from the many trusted individuals we've had in the studio to to check these out has been just as good. Mm. Quite comfortably, some of the best found the speakers. Yeah, I've heard, yeah. Oh, cool. Really? Yeah, really, really. Like, I expected them to be pretty good. Yeah, well, they're better. But, but they're, they are better than pretty good. They're better yeah. than I, well, I was hoping they were going to be. They, um, yeah, they just fucking sing, man. They sound yeah. great. <laughs> I always, whenever I look at three ways speakers, yeah. I always go like that because I have such bad experience with them around the crossover points where, where I love the two way systems. And then as soon as you put in a mid driver, everything gets muddy and you you, you hear the the, 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 the the weird phasey things going on around the crossover points, but there's nothing yeah. there. That's really it's clean. Digital crossovers, are they? All digital. That is the most I've ever heard, like, this, like, the, the detail left to right of like where exactly his hands are on the piano. <laughs> Have you not got speakers? Like they're not on, are they? Nope. What? I don't understand no. how you're doing this. <laughs> so what are they and who makes them? We do. We need to be working in Dolby Atmos and so like many of you we embarked on a journey earlier this year to find our ideal monitoring solution and it hasn't been easy. The problem is that I spend most of my working day mastering in stereo and over the past couple of decades I've upgraded my monitoring as my skills have improved and now I'm very used to mastering on high-end monitors and of course regular viewers to the channel will know why. It's all about detail, translation and accuracy. You can hear things on expensive full range monitors that you just can't hear on budget near fields and once you've experienced that level of detail then it's very difficult to go back. Masters I've mastered on my ATCs also translate very well to other systems and that's what it's all about. So for Dolby Atmos we wanted that top tier level of monitoring but all around the room and that gets pretty expensive very quickly. So we hopped on the tube and trekked into central London to see and hear what some of the studios there were doing and we were to be honest distinctly underwhelmed by most of them and really disappointed with more than a handful. And here's why. Part of Dolby's best practices for Atmos for music specify the same full range speaker all around the room, or at the very least smaller models that tonally match from the same manufacturer. What we found in nearly all the rooms we visited were full range mastering grade monitors at the front for left and right, some of which cost upwards of £100,000 a pair, and then on wall or in wall speakers for surround that kind of sounded like they came out of a car door and cost a couple of hundred quid. So a slight disparity there. So how about averaging it out and using a decent mid-range monitor all around and just getting used to not having that ATC level of detail? Well, we didn't like that either. And whilst you could argue that a stunning pair of speakers for left and right and a compromise for everything else is probably okay for Dolby Atmos for music, we wanted to build a system that would far exceed the quality of anything we'd heard on our adventures to other studios. But, to get the system with three-way ATCs we wanted would have cost exactly five times more than my first house. And labels have already run out of money when they've finished the stereo record. So to make that back working in Atmos would take a very long time indeed. So we decided we were left with two options. One, compromise, or two, build our own speaker. And compromise just isn't in our vocabulary. So build our own speakers, we did. After researching the cost of drivers used in many high-end monitors, we were actually quite shocked. The tweeters in these ATC SEM35, for example, retail at 17 pounds. 17 quid. 
and that's retail. So all we need are some really good drivers in a really good box with some really good amplification and we're sorted, yeah? Mm, turns out it's not that easy and we knew it wasn't going to be easy but we didn't just randomly start buying a load of speaker drivers and then throwing them in a box. A lot of thought and research went into our decision making process and we did have a lot of help and encouragement from some people who really know what they're talking about when it comes to speaker design. So here's a very trimmed down list of the requirements we came up with for our own speaker. To meet Dolby's specifications, it has to be full range and relatively flat all the way down to 40 Hz, whilst capable of putting out a constant 85 dB of SPL at the listening position with an additional 20 dB of headroom to allow for peaks. All the speakers should feature exactly the same drivers to be sonically identical, but with the possibility of different cabinet styles to suit the location in the room. The room is roughly 6 meters long and 4 meters wide with a 3.5 meter high ceiling, so we wanted to go shallow and tall on the side walls but could afford to go for a deeper, shorter cabinet for the ceiling. The quality bar is set high. I must be totally confident and happy mastering on the speakers as a stereo pair. They must be good enough for me to be comfortable in retiring the ATCs from this room. And I'm a huge ATC fanboy, as you know, so that's a very, very high bar indeed. But they must be honest, brutally so, uncoloured, with super low distortion, and translation to other playback systems must be impeccable. They must be active. A lot of the Atmos systems we heard were based on passive designs and whilst you can get great results from a passive design, Kerr Acoustic being a perfect example of that, it's hard enough tailoring your speakers to your listening position in stereo so when you've got 16 of them around the room you need to be able to tweak things easily without having to get the soldering iron out and replacing a load of components. They must look professional. Dolby will be coming in to test the room, so not only must they sound first class, but they must look like a professional product as well. They must feature exceptional stereo imaging with a wide dispersion and a concrete phantom center. If we slowly pan an object from the front left speaker to the rear left speaker, we want to hear it move down the wall to be able to feel we can reach out and touch it and not just hear it skip from speaker to speaker. It has to be cost effective and we wanted to keep as much of the outsourcing in the UK or Europe as possible and lead times must be in days or a few weeks and not months or years. So the first task was to build a stereo pair and see if we could build a pair of speakers that would enable Mark to retire the ATCs or rather give them to me for my video editing suite. So where do you start? Well, we decided to start with the front end, the crossover design and amplification. We set up our tried and trusted Quested Q115 stereo pair to experiment on with different options. And there aren't many options available to the DIY enthusiast when it comes to active crossovers, but Mark discovered a company in the US called X Kits Electronics who make a range of two and three way active line level crossovers that spec'd out very well. And here is the crossover we chose. A three-way design with balanced XLR input for the full range line level signal and balanced XLR outputs for low, mid and high, crossed over at 400Hz and 3.5kHz with 4th order 24dB per octave Linkwitz Riley slopes. We set these up with our Quested speakers and existing amplification and were really impressed with the results. The unit uses high quality Burr Brown op amps with less than 0.00005% total harmonic distortion and you can easily change the crossover frequencies by replacing these plug-in resistor modules. We also ordered their power supply for prototyping that powers two of these boards for a stereo pair. All in all a very impressive product if you're interested in building your own active two or three-way crossover. This was put on the shelf whilst we searched for an amplification solution and one name kept popping up time and time again. Hypex. Hypex are a Dutch company and their highly regarded Encore amplifiers were designed by Bruno Putzis, who's also responsible for Grim Audio, Purify and the superb Key 3 speakers. Indeed, Hypex amplifier modules are found in products from many high-end brands, including the Trinov range of amplitude amplifiers that start at around £8,500 in the UK. Hypex also make a range of plate amps using their Encore technology, as well as a dedicated DSP module that's specifically designed for their Encore family of amplifiers. Now, these, the modules, aren't that easy to get hold of. The plate amps you can buy off the shelf from companies such as Sound Imports in the Netherlands, as well as directly from Hypex themselves. 
But to get these, you need an OEM account and have to prove that you're a registered business as well as provide evidence to show that you're building an active speaker. And there are contractual obligations that mean you can't just sell these boards on. They have to be incorporated into a product. So we started with a pair of plate amplifiers, the FA253, giving 250 watts to the bass, 250 watts to the mid, and 100 watts to the tweeter, and were very, very impressed indeed when we fired the Quested's up with them. The Fusion series of plate amplifiers also feature AES, Speedif, and Toslink digital inputs, and we really can't hear a difference when switching between those and the analog input. The DSP and onboard conversion are very, very transparent indeed. So this led to the decision to ditch the active analog crossover from X kits and go with the DSP option. That way we could easily tweak crossover slopes and EQ curves directly in the Hypex filter designer software, as well as perfectly time align the drivers, and that could all be taken care of in speaker. So what about the drivers? Well, that's been a journey, and one of the requirements on our list that any outsourced products had to be available has been one of the hardest to navigate, and this has been particularly tough with mid drivers and tweeters. But we found a new German company that make a three inch dome mid range driver that can only be described as astonishing, and they also make a range of fantastic tweeters to match. So we'll cover driver choices in the next video and talk to the man who's responsible for creating them. So stay tuned and make sure you've ding the ding dong to be notified of that. Thanks for watching and you'll see us in the next one.